Chapter 20. Men, Women, and Soulmates. Gosh, talk about your complicated issues. What could be more complicated, and be such a prime focus of our lives than relationships? And I thought metaphysics was complicated. But actually, once you understand a little of the basics of life, relationships aren't really that complicated at all. Missing Pieces. I had been very lonely since I was a young boy, both in the sense of the world as a whole, and in the sense of missing a mate. Of course, I didn't know anything about the concept of soulmates, I just knew I missed, someone, that wasn't there, who was kind, thought like me, and was supposed to be living with me. Again, I wasn't an average child by any means. How about a five-year-old romantic? I made a tape collage of love songs that I fell asleep to every night, as I snuggled my teddy bear, and when I got too old for the teddy bear, a pillow. I did learn about the concept of soulmates eventually. And while I had a girlfriend before I left for the monastery, it wasn't that perfect dream relationship, I had always longed for or read about. As you may remember early in the book, I mentioned that I mistook Anastasia's kindness, attention, and love, for, that she had a thing for me. And even if I hadn't, I would have had a thing for her, well, I had that crush for a while, until I found out she wasn't interested in me in, that way, and then I went back to looking, longing, and being lonely. And time marches on. A couple of years later, even after returning to the monastery with my new humility, I was still alone. And my true learning was really just beginning. I had been back about a year. I was well over my early infatuation with Anastasia, but I was still really wishing I had a woman in my life. But I was unattractive, not physically, mind you, but unattractive in a real sense. I was unattractive on the inside. I didn't even have myself together, so I certainly wasn't able to be together with someone else in a relationship that would be positive and helpful to the woman. I wasn't serving God or unselfishly loving, so I really didn't radiate any love or charisma. Boring. I, like most men, was a wanter rather than a giver. I was inwardly wimpy, weak. Most women want a man that is inwardly strong, and not needy of them. That goes even more so for higher consciousness women. And even higher consciousness women also want one who is at least dedicated to God and achieving enlightenment, if not already enlightened. But that didn't stop me from wanting one anyway. One day I asked Zane, if he knew where my soulmate was, or how I could find her, and if I would ever find her. His answer was, as expected, an enlightening ego blow. Your questions are irrelevant, he said. Why, I asked befuddledly. Because, what do you imagine a soulmate to be, and what you think a soulmate relationship is, and would be like, is not accurate. You mean you can't have an idyllic relationship with anyone? No, you can't have such a relationship. The kind you imagine in your mind at this time. It cannot exist for you at this time in your life and consciousness. He said, until the universal spirit reigns on the throne of your will, such a relationship would be one of major conflict, not bliss. You are not right within yourself, you are not right with your relationship with God, and any soulmate relationship you might have now is doomed to failure, even if, as I naively anticipated and hoped, your soulmate has an angelic demeanor as you imagine. He smiled like a cat that swallowed a canary, and said, Don't get me wrong, a soulmate relationship at the state of consciousness you are in now, could be good for you, but only in the sense that it could intensify your stress, and thus might speed you on your path. I managed a squirmy nod and an insincere smile, acknowledging his amusing comment. Why, I said. Because she would make your life miserable and you would fight all the time. Later in this chapter I explain why that is so. The bottom line was, he strongly advised against anyone, including, the center of the world, me of course, making an effort to find a soulmate. Which he was about to explain. Next, he gave me a concerned stare, the hierarchy knows what is best. If you need a burr under your robe, karma will find a soulmate for you at this time in your consciousness. But it is most sublime when the coming together of soulmates is the outcome of spiritual development, and they are of higher consciousness. He told me I needed to let go of my desire for, and attachment to, women for now. You should concentrate on finding God first. Then you should always first and foremost be God's soulmate, God's helpmate, totally, in love with, and devoted to, the universal spirit. 
Then, he said, and only then, after you have become attached to the Universal One, and found inner and outer harmony, will those who should be with you in oneness with spirit, be with you in the beautiful harmony you are imagining. I understood, but I hadn't realized it yet, or understood how very important it was. It was going to be my next biggie, jump in consciousness, the hard way. Shortly after that conversation, a new female novice arrived at the monastery. As soon as I saw her, I was in love, meaning I developed a very serious selfish crush. Her name was Venus, of course, she had to be named Venus, and she looked like an angel, which shouldn't have mattered to me, but it did. It was terrible, I had never been more infatuated in my young life. But she showed no interest in me. So I went to Zane, and asked if he could help me with my problem. Specifically, I asked if there was any way he could pull some strings and set me up with her. First, he gave me a long list of texts to look up in the library. Then he said, no problem, leave it all to me. I was elated, but as it turned out, my crush was to end up crushing my selfish separate self. And it was one of the most painful experiences in my growth. As the sun and the planets, are we in true form? Lovers one, yet seeming apart. Elements of one flow when in our right way, separate and opposite, when lost is the way. One being with multiple parts, before time on earth. Male and females, lost on the earth. Outer parts lost first then to the core reverse it we must, in reverse order. The female elements of each soul AR system, orbiting like planets on the outer reaches of us, were the first to enter the new space of Earth. Tempted and allured, they separated from the male elements, and reversed polarity. Becoming like male elements, out of balance. The male elements were the next exposed, and reversing polarity, they became as female elements. The former male elements now reversed in polarity, turned from the one. And towards the former female elements. Now all had reversed roles, and lost their place with the one. All were out of universal harmony and flow, planets no longer attracted to suns by their gravity, and no longer orbiting the suns. Now suns chase the planets and chaos reigns in the world of humans. Now for the return the order of the fall must be reversed. You who would find your soulmates. Men, seek not women. Seek God first. Then accept the women who come to you. With unselfish love. Women, attempt not, to change a man. Seek God first. And find a man who is one with the one. A man who sought God first. So, after reading the teachings and having them go in one ear and out the other, I went to find out what strings had been pulled to get me together with Venus. This is what that clever devil, Zane, did to help me get Venus. He pulled some strings all right. He set me up all right. But he knew what would happen also. What he did was to arrange things so Venus and I had to share the same living quarters. He even asked her to do things for me. Things she may have done out of love if she loved me, like give me massages, make dinners, etc. She agreed to do this, taking it as a test, and as part of her learning giving, and self-discipline. She did it, but she didn't like it. It's not that she hated it, she was a good person, and a giving person, but she didn't like it, or enjoy it like when you do something for a mate you care for. It drove me nuts. Her mat was right next to mine. She slept right next to me every night, but she didn't have any interest in me as a man. Then to make matters worse, she ended up being attracted to my best friend there, Ulysses, a fellow monk who was also a musician. He was someone I played with during practice every day, spent leisure time with, and enjoyed a great rapport with. Every day, Venus would come and fondly watch Ulysses, while we played our music, and practiced. And I could tell he liked her also. She even proposed to him, asking to become his mate. She wanted to move out of my quarters, and in with him. And I knew that, but Zane asked her to wait, because I wasn't well done, enough yet. He was driving me nuts. She was driving me nuts. It was driving me nuts. Actually, the truth was, it was only me driving me nuts, but I didn't see it that way at the time. Finally, one day I couldn't take it anymore. It was too much to bear. I grabbed a parka, walked out the back gate, and began wandering the mountains in extreme emotional distress. I wandered for days. It was hard and painful, and it was all I could do. Then finally on the fourth day, it hit me.
I had to give up women. Essentially, I had to marry God. I had to pull myself together and focus only on God, become devoted to God, and serving God. As soon as I truly realized this, and I did it inside, it all fell into place. So many things changed in my mind, my thoughts and emotions. And as I would soon find out, in my life. One of the major changes brought about by this realization, was that, all of a sudden, I finally understood women. I never understood them before. As with most men, they were like aliens to me previously, like that, women are from Neptune, and men are from Uranus, type stuff. The way they thought and behaved really made absolutely no sense to me before. Now I know that there is no way women can be really understood or appreciated by any man, until the man becomes enlightened or at least partially enlightened. Sure, therapists can help you put band-aids on things, or just, accept, your mate. And relationship seminars can teach you to fake caring about each other, and how to go through the motions, but only real unselfish caring makes the real difference. And a woman who is really unselfishly loved, can blossom like fields of flowers in a spring rain. I realized what a woman's place was, it was in the home where they belong, joke. Sorry, I just couldn't resist that joke. I realized women's place in the grand scheme of things, and the beauty of the receptive principle, which they manifested. They weren't for being taken from, they were for giving to, not in the giving to their selfish separate self, or spoiling someone, but in the same sense that the sun gives to the planets, and they create life. Like Mother Earth, everything that the sun gives to her, she takes in, and gives birth to new creation. If you give a woman even just a little real love, if she is also a caring woman, she takes what you give, adds herself to it, multiplies it, and gives even more. You get so much back in return for so little, it's phenomenal. Previously, I had never been treated very well by women, to say the least. At best, I was ignored. For the first time, I really knew why. And also for the first time, I could love them without, wanting, them, or being, needy, and, longing for them. I had now turned towards God for my nourishing rather than women, and I turned to God to serve, rather than women, in the sense of constantly trying to please a woman because you want something from them or you don't want them to be, negative, or in a bad mood, with you. I made it back to the monastery that evening, and entered the residential area through the side kitchen door. There were over 50 people in there preparing food for evening meals, including women. All the women turned and looked at me as I came in, all with a big kind smile on their faces. I had let go of Venus, during those four days in the mountains, and she happily got together with her true love. But within a week, I had five proposals. All of a sudden, I was attractive. And it was all just a simple change that seemed so hard before. All I had to do was unselfishly love, instead of want. But none of the five women that wanted to be with me then, were my soulmates, and I still hoped for someone that would really be a part of me. A helpmate that served the universal spirit along with me. I went to Zayn to ask his guidance, and he told me I should accept and love whomever comes to me for love and caring, and especially not reject anyone just because I didn't think they were my soulmate. That's the beginning of another quandary, and a long story for another time. Then he started to tell me about the disintegration of male, female soulmate relationships in Atlantis. One of these stories sounded remarkably like the Bible story of Adam and Eve, and as I soon found out, with good reason. He told me to read some of the biblical scrolls, about, Adam and Eve, then talk to him about it. And I didn't even need a library card. Like I said earlier, when I first arrived at the monastery in Tibet, I was delighted to find that it had an extensive library which included many ancient writings. This was, library heaven, for a young man who, as a teenager, read every book about metaphysics, spirituality, and religion, that he could get his hands on. And I'd heard about the Vatican Library, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, but both were off limits to the public. Here I was able to read original manuscripts of the writings that eventually became the Bible, along with the sacred texts of many other religions. These old biblical writings were relatively new manuscripts compared to many there. But right now I was focused on the biblical scrolls, particularly ones dealing with Adam and Eve, some of these biblical manuscripts were much like the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. But the translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls have been hampered, and some authors have written out and out fake alleged translations of them. 
Also, unlike the Dead Sea Scrolls which were sold here and there and spread all over the place, our biblical scrolls were complete, properly preserved and intact. And we had them in both the original languages in hand, and all had been unbiasedly translated into several languages. There was far more in them, than in the modern Bible, including such seemingly less significant scrolls detailing things like Jesus' dietary teachings. I really had to keep focused on what I was doing, but as I read them, old memories that I found disturbing came back to me. Father? I said, as I was reading the old biblical scrolls, it reminded me of my youth. I read the Bible earlier in my life, quite thoroughly, and I found it to not only be confusing, but conflicting with its own teachings. Yes. Well, why would that be, if the writings were true, valid, and important? I mean, why do we consider it something to study and learn from, other than to understand the beliefs of others better? First, what we have is complete, and unadulterated. Which you will understand the great significance of when you have read even more of them. And secondly, you must understand that much of it was not literal, it was written symbolically, and as allegory, in order to convey basic spiritual ideals and principles, in a palatable form for the masses. I understand that, but still, much doesn't make sense. I rejected it myself years ago. You rejected a very different thing, that you did not have the keys nor wisdom to understand. But still, it had truth in it, did it not? Don't reject the ancient scrolls because of that sun, learn to understand it. How? For the seeker of the deepest level of truth within, it includes a code, consisting of all kinds of symbology, including numerology. Since you have read it, I'm sure you noticed that certain numbers seem to appear repeatedly throughout the stories. Things like, it rained for 40 days, or, he wandered through the desert for 40 days, etc., etc. Threes and sevens are also extensively used. Yes, I have, and it did seem rather odd that there were so many repeated numbers and patterns, but I didn't even really think about it at the time. That was the idea, you weren't supposed to think about it, they didn't want you to. What do you mean? The original Bible manuscripts included a numerological reference called the Kabbalah, or Kwabbalah, and other sections that tied logical explanations to what appeared to be contradictions, after these sections were removed or modified. These sections of the Bible gave the perceptive seeker the keys to unlock the manuscript's secrets, so they could be understood on deeper levels, and multiple levels. Even to use just the numerology as an example, if you understood that the number 4 or 40, numerologically represents a total transformation, a crucifixion, a death and rebirth of some sort, a given story may mean something much different, or much deeper to you. Or that 3 represents a whole, or, a body, it adds new meaning to the stories, yes? The modern Bible is missing its keys. It has been for many decades. You can check with Gabriel but I believe the Kabbalah alone was deliberately deleted around the 3rd century AD. Why? The usual power, control of the masses, or someone wanting some kind of personal gain. Yet at our library here, it has remained intact in its original form. As you know, much of it is written in the Grand Master's own hand. So it's all an issue of breaking this numerical code? No, I didn't just say numerical code. There is a symbolic code also. You cannot take things so literally, you must open up your mind to the universal symbology of things. And some of it is simply literal. Thus the Atlantean children's interpretation and understanding of the meaning of the Bible's stories, maybe, usually are, very different than anyone else's. Adam and Eve, as soulmates. Can you give me some examples right now father? I can give you an example that goes to the very core of what you have been going through lately, how would that be? Great. Consider, for instance, the Bible story of Adam and Eve. Here we have a story of the origins of human life on earth, the story of the original soulmates and original sin. The Bible gives a version that can be taken literally or symbolically. The Atlantean version of creation is similar, but they did not code the true meanings. What do these stories offer us? Understanding of what happened to us and our soulmates. It can help us answer questions like you asked me, where is my soulmate? And, why are they not with us right now? The fact is, something is obviously wrong, and we need some answers so we can set it right.
In order to understand who our soulmates may or may not be, and how to find them, we first need to understand what a soulmate is, and why we now find ourselves separate from our soulmates. The story of Adam and Eve, when looked at in a certain light, can help us understand this. How? It hasn't helped me, be patient. I'm sorry father, please go on. The typical interpretation of the Bible story of Adam and Eve is what, Peniel? Well, basically it's that Adam was the first human created by God, and then Eve was created from him, because he was lonely. Yes, yes, what else? They lived in paradise and needed nothing. God said they could eat anything, except the fruit from one particular tree in the garden. What tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Good, sounds like a strange tree to have fruit you can eat from, don't you think? I nodded. He looked at me eagerly and said, then what? Then Eve was tempted by a serpent, telling her that if they ate the forbidden fruit, they would be as powerful as God. She subsequently tempted Adam with it. They ate the fruit, hid from God, and were kicked out of paradise. Okay, good enough. The newer ancient teachings say this story was a parable loosely based on the ancient Atlantean teachings, about the first Atlantean soulmate group to lose universal consciousness. The ancient texts basically say that they lost their universal consciousness because of selfishness that led to separating from the One. The Atlantean texts don't conflict with the Bible story, but it does add details and shed new light on it. The later teachings further say that the story was written to allegorically represent all of us who fell out of oneness with the Universal Spirit, not just one couple. Not just Adam and Eve? Yes and no, if you remember your history, which I know you do, you'll remember that the ancient Atlantean historical records say that we all started as spiritual beings, that were not male or female. We were, both, in that we had both male and female parts, inside ourselves. At some point, we came upon the Earth, and beheld the wonders of its physical plane. To exist on this plane though, we had to change from our angelic, spiritual form, into a denser, physical form, in other words we needed physical bodies to fully interact with the physical plane. In the process of making this change, we discovered that we divided into male and female parts, and subsequently, male and female bodies. Enter the concept of Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, along with this change, came, self-consciousness, and worse, self-ishness. This is what led to our separation from the universal spirit, i.e., what the Bible calls eating of the forbidden fruit. This was not real fruit, not a real tree, the knowledge of good and evil meant the duality of the physical plane, rather than oneness. And the biblical, original essence was the selfish separation from God, which brought us into this duality, the action of eating the forbidden fruit, and karmic results, becoming entangled with, caught in, and, cursed with, the plane of duality, the physical plane on earth, the plane of, the knowledge of good and evil. Then the, hiding from God, was actually the separation, and, cut off, from universal consciousness we created ourselves. Good. And the being, kicked out of Eden, was our own subsequent pursuit of selfishness. Very good. But what about the separation of soulmates? What then happens to Adam and Eve to part them? There are several different teachings that involve the story of our manifestation on Earth, and the separation of soulmates. And of course various comparisons can be drawn between all these Atlantean teachings, and the Bible's story of Adam and Eve. One of the most important things that we need to understand, is that losing touch with our soulmates, or finding them, is not really the primary problem. It is our separation from God, and our selfishness, that caused the subsequent separation with our soulmates. And dealing with those primary problems must be our primary focus, or we cannot have a good soulmate relationship, or a coming back together in oneness with each other, or God. To those ends, we should examine the comparison of the Atlantean teachings, with the Bible story. But keep in mind there were two waves of manifestation, and parts apply to both, while other parts only apply to one or the other. He then went on to discuss these teachings. In the comparisons below, the Atlantean teachings will appear in regular type. The associated Bible story will be in bold type. We had all the wonder and beauty of the entire universe, which we lived in and enjoyed, after creation. Adam and Eve lived in the Bible's Garden of Eden. 
We could wander and enjoy the entire universe, with no cares, as long as we remained one with it all, in our angelic state. And we see in the Bible story that as long as Adam and Eve remained open, receptive, humble and obedient to the will of the universal spirit, God, all was in perfect balance, and peace, harmony, and happiness prevailed. But we had free will. In coming upon the wonders of the unique experience of the earth, we found that we enjoyed the sensations of delving into the polarized material plane. But to do this, we had to lower our vibration, and partake of the separateness of manifesting into physical existence. We were faced with an option to either just appreciate it, but not get attached to it, or get fully involved, and enmeshed in it. In contemplating their free will choices, and realizing we could do other than God's will, we exercised this right selfishly. This resulted in separation from the One, and the creation of a world full of selfish people. Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dichotomy, duality, material manifestation. And in so using their will to go against the will of God, they separated themselves from God, the One. The original, sin, selfishness, was committed, and by the universal law of cause and effect, separation from God ensued. This was the, casting out, from Eden, paradise. Thusly no longer one with God, or in harmony with universal will, they accumulated negative karma from selfish behavior, that resulted from their separate self-consciousness, which created a life of suffering and darkness. Losing touch. So as usual, it all comes back to selfishness, and this led to the separation from God, and the whole mess. But becoming separated from God was just the beginning. The teachings clearly indicate that the reason why we are not together with our soulmates, is because we separated from them via selfishness. It is the end result in a chain of events. It started with, self-consciousness, which led to the developing of selfishness and separation from the universal spirit. Then it went further, and our selfishness led to our ultimate aloneness. No blame. But what about how this has all come to be blamed on, Eve, or the feminine aspect? It seems that Adam was as much at fault, if not more so. Very insightful, I'm proud of you, Eve, has been blamed for the fall, and for all the problems humankind has had since, along with the tempting serpent. This is partly due to the way some religions have presented the story of Adam and Eve, and the way various social orders choose to see it. This created a scourge on women throughout the ages. But women should not be singled out for blame. Like you said, even in the orthodox biblical way of interpreting the story, it never would have been such a problem if, Adam, had not partaken of this, fruit, regardless of whether Eve did or not. But did Adam have any more of a chance to resist temptation than Eve? Yes and no, it's not nearly as simple as it all seems. What do you mean? It doesn't seem all that simple to me, as it is. Father laughed, and smiled at me like a parent who was lovingly amused at the innocent ignorant remarks of his five-year-old child. I mean that a realization of the nature of our true beings totally changes the perceptual meaning of the story. The better you understand what was said earlier, that our true form is both male and female soulmates who are really just aspects of a singular being, the better will your perception reveal to you the truth in the story. Again, our angelic nature was a sexual polarity integrated being, both male and female elements within one, angel. That's why angels are sometimes perceived as sexless or neutral sexually, it's not because they are sexless, but because they are balanced, they contain both sexes in one being, in harmony, see? I'm stunned, what a realization, I'd never even considered it in quite that way before. But those elements weren't even considered, male and female, as they would be now, until way after our degeneration. Now you're losing me again, I'm afraid I'm having a hard time getting a good grip on that father. To grasp the polarities of our human condition is difficult without universal consciousness. Let me think, perhaps the best way we can understand it with our limited brains, and limited viewpoint, is to try and understand it using several scientific analogies from the ancient teachings. Oh good, my limited brain should have a much easier time with, scientific analogies, from the ancient teachings. It won't be that difficult. I am actually trying to make it simpler for you to understand, so don't block up your brain with fears of complications that don't exist. I'm sorry again father, maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. Sure, I'm certain that will be simple for you.
I'd like to see you accomplish that for a day sometime. I can, I just. Oh, sorry. Please go on. I'll try not to interrupt you. Never try anything, either do or don't do. I put my hand over my mouth. Before we go on with Zane's examples, let me interject this little pre-concept. Now, keep in mind that the terms positive and negative, which are used in the examples you're about to read, are meant in the sense of the nature of polar opposites, such as those found with electrical charges and the ends of a battery. He isn't using the terms to mean good or bad, as in having a positive or negative attitude. While we do use the terms in that way elsewhere in the book, it is an entirely different meaning than what are used in the following examples. Still with my hand over my mouth, I nodded to father to indicate I would be quiet and let him continue his discussion. He raised an eyebrow over the ridiculousness of me putting my hand over my mouth, and then he went on. First, let's draw a comparison between electricity and the male-female polarities within us. People often think of electricity as positive and negative charges. But actually, it is just one energy, and it flows through something as one electrical flow, moving in one direction in a circle. It is only when you divide this flow by severing this flow, this circuit, separating the oneness of the flow somewhere, that you get the polarities, the polar opposite terminals of plus n. When severed, it is called positive, on the side where electrons would be outflowing, and negative, on the other side where there is a receptive, or vacuum, condition, an absence of electrons, and a condition of wanting to accept electrons. When the circuit is intact, the flow is one circle, moving from the direction of what would be the positive terminal if it were cut, to the direction of what would be the negative terminal if it were cut. But what does that have to do with soulmates F.A.? Sorry. Okay, let's try something else. Perhaps one of the best ways to understand our natures, is by contemplating stars and atoms, and understanding them better. Look around you. Everything you see is an illusion of sorts, created by atoms grouped together in certain ways, and vibrating at different speeds. Look outside the planet, and you find vast infinite space, sprinkled with stars and planets. Stars and planets are virtually the same as atoms, but on a different scale. Atoms and star systems are all there really is in the entire universe. And if we observe them, we find they both act in virtually the same manner, they have the same pattern of existence. It is a pure pattern of a radiating energy, receiving energy, male, female attraction, attachment and dependence. And every element of a star system or atom, plays all these various roles. It is a pattern of a way of life, that fits into everything else in the universe harmoniously. Both follow some perfect marching orders that the universe has come up with for life in harmony with all other life. Both function on positive and negative polarities attracting and engaging with each other. Male and female elements in a perfect perpetual dance. In that sense, it could be said that the entire universal order is based on sex. The workings of the atom and of solar systems are just like our essential. The universal orbital pattern which is also the basis of solar systems and atoms. Beingness our true nature, it is what we really are. Our true natures can thus be likened to the elements of an atom. Electrons which are negatively charged, receptive, female principle, are attracted to, and in the orbit of, the nucleus which has positive charge, plus, outflowing, male principle, of an atom. It is the same with the planet or planets, female, that are in orbit of a star, male, in one solar system. It is not by accident that we call the planet we live on, Mother, Earth. If the Earth is the mother of life here, who is the father? The Sun, life would not exist without the interaction, the intercourse of the energies of either. A solar system is not really a bunch of planets and a star, it is one whole being. The male and female elements, stars, planets, are soulmates within this one being. But they don't have relationships like soulmates, like humans. Don't they? Even though you don't see the Sun and planets touching each other, they are indeed, touching, and in constant contact with each other. There is also constant, interplay or intercourse of many energies. You just don't perceive it with your limited senses, although human scientists can pick up some of them with their scientific sensors. Yet they generally ignore things that aren't, physical. What energies? Take, gravity, for just one thing. 
Ask a scientist why the planets are orbiting the sun. Gravity. But just what is gravity? What does that really mean? Scientists don't really understand what gravity is. Could it actually involve outflowing love and attraction? Are you saying that's what it is? Just think about it, and go put your hand over your mouth again. At least you look like you're listening better that way.